likability is so important and it's not status. In fact, the about two thirds of those who have the highest levels of status, they're actually very, very disliked. Now, if you can have both, that's great. But, you know, odds are statistically that status might come at some expense of likability, um, or at least it's hard to manage both at the same time. But likability is powerful, just like you're saying. It doesn't matter about your Twitter followers. It doesn't matter about your wealth or your power or your visibility. It matters when you can connect with somebody and help them to feel validated and included, to help them know that you're on their side and to make the interaction enjoyable. Likeability predicts our lifespan. The more likable we are, the longer we live, controlling for every other possible factor that can be thought of. The more likable we are, the less likely we are to have diseases. We're more likely, ironically, to you know, have a partnership that we're happy with for our children to become more likable. We're going to go further in our jobs. We actually do end up making more money. Likeability is what we should be caring, teaching, thinking about. And it's what that 15-year-old in high school that's really an unpopular nerd should be caring about the most. Um, because that's going to be the factor that's going to carry them through life in a really, really positive way. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Mitch, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So I found out about your work because uh, Amazon recommended your book, Popular, The Power of Likeability in a uh, Status-Obsessed World. And it just the title alone grabbed me as somebody who wasn't popular in high school. I thought, okay, this is something I really want to understand. Um, and if somebody has actually decoded this into a science, then I definitely want to understand it. Uh, <laughs> And so given the background that you have and the nature of your subject matter, I want to start with what I think is a highly relevant question to it. And that is, what social group were you a part of in high school? And how did that end up influencing the choices that you've made throughout your life and career? <laughs> well, I'll give you a few hints. Uh, I was under five feet tall until 11th grade. I probably weighed about 80 pounds when I graduated high school. I had glasses with bifocals. And I wore parachute pants. So obviously I was the coolest kid in school, right? No, uh, I was, I was, uh, I was kind of a nerd and uh, kind of proud of it. And, um, but I was that kid that was constantly looking around the cafeteria and around school and being like, why are these kids popular? And why am I not? And, you know, which kids are most popular and how does that matter? You know, should I care about this after I graduate high school? I had no idea there was an entire science about this. Uh -huh. So I mean, what in the world led you down this career trajectory? Because I, you know, like almost every single person I interview, you know, studying popularity for a living doesn't seem like something that a high school guidance counselor is going to say, yeah, this might be a good career path. <laughs> I, um, I was always interested in psychology. You know, I, I, it wasn't just that people told me about, you know, talking with others and listening to their problems, but I loved science. I love the idea that there's a science that studies what we think, how we behave, what choices we make, what attitudes we have. And, you know, for me, it felt like my peers were so incredibly impactful in the kid that I was becoming and the adult that I was growing up to be that it was fascinating to me that a lot of people did not spend time focusing on how our peer interactions are really related to our adjustment overall. So when I was applying to graduate school, I found all these researchers that were working on our peer relationships, including our popularity, as being a big predictor of outcomes. What I didn't know is that it was a bigger predictor of outcomes than everything else. It's, you know, it predicts our life success and our happiness and our risks for um, disease and mental health even more than our IQ does or our family's economic background it predicts more than our physical health. So I kind of somehow accidentally stumbled into this area that was wildly important, but was really, really not discussed a lot. 
Yeah. So uh, first off, um, did your parents encourage any particular career path? Uh, you know, I, I, this is always something I'm interested in because, uh, you know, as an immigrant, you know, Indian parents are always very clear on exactly what they think you should do, even though they're not always right. I'm Jewish. So I had two choices, a doctor or a lawyer. And um, <laughs> that was communicated yeah. to me very, very clearly. And um, when I said I wanted to be a teacher or an actor, I was told no. And then I found a loophole. I said, wait a minute, but if I'm a college professor, then I'm a teacher, but they would call me doctor. Does that, does that work? Because I'll have a PhD. And that I got a pass. So that was okay. Um, and <laughs> so I was really steered very clearly into that direction. Yeah. Um, so in college, so did, did you, <clears throat> because it, it's funny, right? So, you, you know, we talk about high school and we're like, okay, whatever, it doesn't matter who cares, right? We get older, we're like, ah, totally irrelevant. Who cares about high school now? Did you transcend the sort of nerdiness when you got to college or was it just something that still continued? And then how did uh, this sort of desire to understand this affect your college experience? So, you know, I went to college at a time when there was no social media. There was, you know, a different world, really. It was back in the, the early 90s. And the popularity dynamic still played out a little bit because there was a big Greek system. So the fraternity houses were, you know, clearly on different points in the status hierarchy. There were more and less cool and popular fraternities. And I was in a kind of middle of the road fraternity. So it changed a little bit uh, for me while I was in college. But really what I found was that I continued to really connect with my peers. And really then it was when I was introduced to psychological science and realized, wait a minute, so there's a way to quantify this and study this and we can actually measure popularity um, and really look at how it affects kids for decades later. That fascinated me. Uh, by the time I was applying to grad school, I was kind of hooked. Yeah. Well, let's, let's do this before we get into the book. Um, th there's something I want to, you're, I mean, and I think this is highly relevant to the book. You're an educator. And when I talk to people like you, uh, you know, and talk to the psychologists that I talk to, um, who have ranged from, you know, everybody you could possibly imagine. The one thing I'm always shocked by is the fact that the things that they teach, the things that they write about, the things that people like you, like you write about are not taught in school even though they're so relevant to our lives. Like there's no emotional intelligence class at Berkeley when I went to college. No, you know, when I, I look at a high school guidance counselor, I will say, well, they don't really guide you on anything. They're more like glorified schedule planners. This kills me because, you know, we have science to say that we're not going to be able to be successful in the workplace unless we know how to get along with other people. We're not going to be happy unless we know relationship skills Everything that we're hoping for in our kids really brings us back to psych science and in particular, you know, understanding the dynamics that make people likable. That's not the same thing as being popular, but but making them likable. So I say the same thing. Why are we not teaching a social curriculum in school? Why are we spending time teaching things based on an educational curriculum that was really developed in the 1800s? Um, to teach people how to do math on the side of a boat while they're collecting, you know, a shipping or a, from at the nearest port. Those are not the skills that we need to survive in 2020 and beyond. We need to teach people relationships as well as a variety of other pieces too. And it's, it's just not covered. It's one of the reasons why we sent our kids to where they are because they do have an explicit social curriculum. And we believe that that is a critical skill for kids future. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to come back to, to talking to you about your kids when we, we get into it in the book, when we talk about uh, parenting for popularity. Uh, sure. So the thing is, when you see the fact that this is not in schools, and then you see things like school shootings and, and kids who are, you know, so depressed about school, I mean, suicides are, you know, at an all time high at for kids that are of such a young age. Um, as somebody who studies this, like, doesn't that really trouble you? Yeah, very much so. I mean, before we entered the kind of era that we're in now where status is such a big, big deal, and um, we see some of that on social media, you know, we already were kind of missing the boat on a huge crisis. Suicide is the number two leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 and 24. And if you ask young people why they're attempting suicide, overwhelmingly, they say it's because of interpersonal stress. So something going on in their social lives that's really stressing them out. So why are we not sinking every possible resource into really understanding that and teaching kids how to succeed? It just doesn't make any sense to me. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, what do you think has to happen in order for that to change? Is it at a policy level? Is it at a, at a government level? Like who has the power to change that? Because when I've asked Seth Godin about education, he said the real people who have the power to change things are the parents. I think that's partially true. Um, I think the parents are incredibly um, powerful and really demanding what happens in their school. But of course, you know, with Common Core now, and this is not an area that I know um, as much about as I'm sure your other guests, but I can say that there are too many schools right now that are trying to teach the test to really ensure federal funding um, because they're able to demonstrate competence in areas that are really based on, in some, way, in some cases, antiquated values of what we should be teaching kids in school. Personally, I think that psychological wellness, emotional wellness overall, particularly succeeding with relationships is really, really important to be taught. And we can't just ask parents to do that job. It has to be brought into the schools as well. Yeah. So how do you, as a college professor, how do you see this playing out in the lives of your own students? Because, uh, you know, <clears throat> obviously I think that uh, even for me, there's this fantasy of, oh, now that I'm done with high school, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to be a stud. Like I'll be cool because I can shed my, you know, band geek past. But that turned out to be anything but true. Yeah. You know, you see them scarred by this on the day they walk into, into class and you see it affecting the way that they go through college. And it, it's really painful. It's one of the reasons why I actually wrote the book, because it's so important that we stop the cycle of high school over and over again. But in, unless we're aware and talking about what happened to us in high school and really thinking about the ways that psych tell, psychological science tells us, it influences what we perceive, how we behave, how we emotionally respond to every social interaction in the decades that follow we tend to repeat ourselves. So you see these college kids come, they get their hopes up. They're really excited to kind of reset their social lives. We've actually done research on this at UNC Chapel Hill. 97% of people come into college saying, this is my social reset button, is college. And you see within the course of a semester, they're exactly in the social position they were before because no one's taught them. No one's talked about um, how it is that you can really change things. This episode of The Unmistakable Creative is supported by the Longtime Academy, a new podcast about how to be a good ancestor. It's a show about time and how we think about time. Short-term thinking can be really stressful, and some of us find it difficult to plan for tomorrow or next week, let alone next year or 10 years from now, and long-term thinking can help. If you've ever felt unproductive, exhausted, or worried about the future, or powerless to change the path our world is on, the Longtime Academy can help. You'll hear from people like Brian Eno, Celeste Headley, George the Poet, Roman Kersnerik, Jay Griffiths, and Adrian Murray Brown, and learn how they embrace long-term thinking. The Longtime Academy is an audio documentary, but it also includes practical exercises designed to expand your sense of time and help you be a good ancestor. I got to check out an early episode of the Longtime Academy, and here's what I thought. Listening to the stories on the show causes you to reflect on the past, be more mindful about the present, and more deliberate about the future. So if you're sick of being overwhelmed by the day-to-day, -day, always dwelling on the past, and always worried about what could go wrong in the future, listen to The Longtime Academy. Search for The Longtime Academy anywhere you listen to podcasts. We'll also include a link in the show notes. Life is short. Time is long. The Longtime Academy. Yeah. Have you, have you ever seen the movie Van Wilder? Yes. Okay, so I always look at that movie and I remember thinking, God damn it, why didn't this movie come out before I went to college? <laughs> because I thought to myself, so like, okay, if I gone back now, that is exactly how I would approach my social life. I would try to join as many clubs as possible because the funny thing is you look at it in retrospect and you're like, wait a minute, this is an environment in which people are completely open to meeting new people and there's opportunities galore. But, you know, I, I think the thing for me, particularly at a place like Berkeley, um, you know, I, and I don't know what the population is, the student population is at your university, but when you have these large public schools, um, you know, they're incredibly diverse, yet incredibly ethnocentric. Like I graduated and I was like, wait a minute, like the overwhelming majority of my friends are Indian. I don't really know anybody who's not. Yeah, it is. It is amazing, especially at large public schools. I went to school at Emory for my undergrad. So I had the opportunity to meet tons and tons of people that were by definition going to be different from, from me because, you know, I was a minority kind of going to, I had come from a predominantly Jewish uh, kind of 
white Caucasian, you know, middle class Long Island community. And now I was thrust in the South. There was much more racial ethnic diversity. I was a minority as far as my religious background. So it was it was a bit different. The the parts that I was so shocked by, you know, when reading the research is that in some ways we are replicating our prior experiences, not just by what we volitionally choose to go and do, like join a club or something. But it's in the signals that we give almost subtly. We kind of create these self-fulfilling prophecies every time we walk into a room. I was shocked how much just our nonverbal signals, you know, supersede anything that we're actually saying or doing or choosing because they already are communicating and, and leading to contagion and mood and, and uh, reactions more than even what we say. That, to me, was the huge tragedy, that there are kids that leave high school, that just need a mirror and a, and a coach and a little bit of time thinking about the ways they interact socially to really be able to change things around. Yeah. So it, let's let's get into the book because you open the book and you say two things that really struck me. You said, what we've learned about popularity is something of a paradox. It's fundamental to human nature to desire to be more popular, but that doesn't mean being popular is always good for us. And then you said society has become fixated on status and all of its trappings, fame, wealth, and celebrity, even though the research suggests that this is exactly what we should be avoiding if we want to foster a culture of kindness and contentment. So what do you think is is driving this obsession with status? I mean, obviously, I, I am sure that social media plays a role because I think a lot about status, um, particularly given that, you know, what I do, I talk to people of high status all day long. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that you brought that up. I mean, I think that um, social media is a symptom. It's not really the cause. I don't think it's helping anything, but I think that there is a bigger issue that started you know, some people talk about in the 80s when there's a shift in the way that the media started portraying news stories through people, um, where somehow we have become remarkably status oriented. And by that, I mean that popularity comes in two flavors. You've got likability, um, people you want to spend time with, they make you feel happy and good about yourself. And then you've got status, which is what we all remember from high school. It's that kind of who's most powerful, influential, visible, dominant. And you know, in America, especially, status is a big, a big uh, currency for power and for voice and and influence. Um, we we kind of have the market on that here in the states, uh, probably more than any other country. We are interested in individuating from others and being better and higher and uh, having more rather than being more community focused. Um, which is interesting in China, they they don't really have a word that, for popularity the way that the way that we do in a way that matches at least our definition for it. I think that um, the more we have been able to work independently, and the more that we have not needed to rely on others, combined with a change in society that's kind of led to more showcasing of fame, celebrity, wealth, and money. So a lot of people target this. These, the intersection of these two forces is kind of right there in the beginning of the 1980s. Um, that's when our society, for the first time in tens of thousands of years, made it an abrupt shift. We went from being a, a species that works together to, at least in this country, you know, a species that is interested in becoming more powerful than one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, do, do you think there's a way to get back from this? Uh, because it seems like we've pushed self-interest to the point of diminishing returns and something I've said over and over on the show. I feel in a lot of ways, like our government today is the literal embodiment of self-interest pushed to the point of diminishing returns. Like I'm watching a Congress, you know, trying to come to some sort of conclusion on this stimulus package. I'm like a bunch of kindergartners could have done this more effectively. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think government peace absolutely is, you know, really exemplifying all that's bad with status right now, you know, to an extreme and tragic and horrifying way. I I do have hope though. I do because I think that we've we're starting to reach maybe the I hope the part on the pendulum swing where we're going to start to go back. And we're going to see what happens when we let status run amok. What happens when we let people who are only interested in themselves and their Twitter followers and the ability to make as much money as possible assume an unreasonable amount of power? And how does it destroy the fabric of community? 
and contentment and respect for one another. And maybe we've gone too far. The pandemic also has said, okay, you want to all be individuals? I'm going to lock you in your houses. And you can't have any social interaction in groups anymore. Um, and I think we are, these forces are making us suddenly, I hope, crave community, crave connection, recognize the value and the importance of simple kindness and community in a way that I think it took a worldwide pandemic to show us. Um, you know, I wrote the book before knowing anything about a pandemic coming. And in some <laughs> ways, it's more relevant now than I ever had anticipated. Um, because really, it's shown us that we have a choice to make. We can take that natural biological instinct towards caring what other people think about us. We could take it in one of two directions. And here's what it looks like when we take it in the wrong direction. Let's let's really be mindful about how we spend our social energy now to do things that are going to bring us together more. Yeah. Well, it's funny when you talk about status, I, I can't help but think of my my first mentor who was by far the person who had the most impact on my life. And I, I always tell people this, I said, look, like you can't, you know, just judge somebody by the perception of how large their following is on social media. I'm like, he had 150 followers on social media. He was six weeks into his project and he's hands down the most influential person that has ever come into my life. And I've interviewed people who are far more famous or well-known than him. Likeability is so important and it's not status. In fact, the about two thirds of those who have the highest levels of status, they're actually very, very disliked. Now, if you can add both, that's great. But, you know, odds are statistically that status might come at some expense of likability, um, or at least it's hard to manage both at the same time. But likability is powerful, just like you're saying. It doesn't matter about your Twitter followers. It doesn't matter about your wealth or your power or your visibility. It matters when you can connect with somebody and help them to feel validated and included, to help them know that you're on their side and to make the interaction enjoyable. Likeability predicts our lifespan. The more likable we are, the longer we live, controlling for every other possible factor that can be thought of. The more likable we are, the less likely we are to have diseases. We're more likely, ironically, to you know, have a partnership that we're happy with for our children to become more likable. We're going to go further in our jobs. We actually do end up making more money. Likeability is what we should be caring, teaching, thinking about. And it's what that 15-year-old in high school that's really an unpopular nerd should be caring about the most um, because that's going to be the factor that's going to carry them through life in a really, really positive way. Status doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, let's talk about something you say at the very beginning of the book. You say popularity dynamics affect our careers, our success in meeting our goals, our personal and professional relationships, and ultimately our happiness. And we were talking about this idea of you know high school popularity affecting this. Uh, the thing that came to my mind was what about the high school quarterback who peaks in high school? You know, you see this in particularly in places like small Texas towns where these people basically are gods and celebrities for the entire time they're in high school. I mean, you know, I, and I'm not just quoting this from watching. Friday Night Lights. I lived in a small Texas <laughs> town, so I've seen it. And then they basically just go on to live, you know, a fairly unremarkable life. Some of them become, you know, overweight. It's just like I said, when I see I've seen pictures of people who were the most stellar athletes in high school on Facebook and I looking at them thinking, wow, what happened? Yeah, the key to that sentence that you're reading is that it depends on which type of popularity you're talking about, because likability is what predicts all of those great things. Status actually predicts increased risk for depression, anxiety, substance use. High status people are likely to get hired, uh, and but they are also likely, more likely to be demoted or fired. And you're kind of seeing that in the election. Um, I think that uh, what's interesting is that we really focus on status and we think of that as the only kind of popularity that matters. But exactly like you say, the research suggests that those people that peak in high school, they tend to get so positively rewarded at a time when the brain really makes us crave those rewards that they um, very often live the rest of their lives still working from the same playbook. And usually after you graduate high school, that doesn't work. That's why they peaked when they were in high school, because by being aggressive towards others or by focusing on status, research shows that the romantic partners of those prior high school quarterbacks 
say that they're dissatisfied with their relationships. And their friends say that they don't feel like they have close friendships with that former high school quarterback or that prom queen. Hmm. So, okay, let's get into what you call the sociometric groups. You talk about the accepted group, the controversial, the neglected, and the rejected. Can you expand on what those are and how they play a role? Yeah. So these are, if we just look at like ability, forgetting status for a moment, these are the different groupings of how researchers have really thought about how we can categorize people as highly likable or not. And what they've done, yeah, in those groups, it's really, really interesting because I think um, what's always shocking to people is that whatever group you're in, if you walk to the school across town, or if you go to a new meeting as an adult, or if you go to a new workplace, the research says within three hours, you end up in the same group you were in, in your prior context. So it's really, really stable. Um, we can change it. But because we never talk about this, people usually just repeat the same habits and they go back to where they were. The accepted yeah. kids are super likable. The rejected kids are not. The neglected kids are the ones that don't get nominated by their peers as either being liked most or liked least. And people initially were really concerned about these folks, but they're actually okay. If they're neglected because they're super socially anxious, that of course is a concern and there's good mental health treatment for that. Um, but a lot of people are neglected just because they don't feel like they need to get a lot of attention. Um, and that's perfectly fine. That last group, um, other than the average uh, folks, which is about two thirds of us and average does very well here, um, are a group called controversials. They're simultaneously loved and hated within their peer group. <laughs> These kids are like the class clowns. You know, there's not too many of them, but everyone can tell you exactly who they are. They're actually the ones that tend to grow up fixated on status. Mm, wow. So one thing, that, you know, you're talking about prom queens and quarterbacks. So this is, you know, maybe you have the research on this. Uh, this is something I always wonder. Does the hottest girl in school know she's the hottest girl in school? And is that the way she sees herself? Like when you talk to people like this, what does the research show about that? Yeah. So one of the strongest predictors of status is physical attractiveness. And um, because there's so much focus on kind of that status that's associated with, you know, being, uh, you know, really, really physically attractive, people usually know. But it's really interesting that high school reunion effect, when everyone comes back 10, 15, 20 years later and recognizes, wait a minute, you mean the entire time you all thought of it differently than I did? That's a real effect. There are a couple of different ways that people have said that in the research. So there are really self-critical, somewhat depressive, um, hot people, you know, or also high status people that actually never recognize that they had that, that level of status. Mm. So that does happen sometimes. Interestingly, you also get the flip side. You get these kids that are really, really low in status. They also tend, sometimes tend to be aggressive and they don't know they were that low. They think that they were one of the most popular kids in school. So you see it in both ways. Well, it's kind of funny because I just I remember one of my friends <laughs> telling me about going back to the high school reunion and, you know, being the best looking guy there and getting to hook up with the girl who wouldn't give him the time of day in high school. <laughs> like that was a, to him the highlight of his, his high school reunion. And I just I thought that was really funny. And I remember thinking, to myself, I'm like, I wonder if that would happen to me if I went to a high school reunion now. It's so funny. I only went to one, but by the time I got there, I was, you know, probably a foot taller than I was when I graduated high school. And I had gotten into working out and I didn't wear glasses anymore. And I had this weird reaction. No one, no one recognized me at all. I was standing with my high school friends and people went up to us and said, Hey, whatever happened to Mitch Princeton? And they're like, well, he's standing right next to you. And they're like, <laughs> what, what are you talking about? And they're like, he's, that's him. That's Mitch Princeton. And yeah. it was it was really funny. I mean, I didn't look great or anything. I'm not saying that. I just looked really different. And um, and people, it, it was the same thing. Like suddenly, all the kids that were really popular in high school were like, "Hey, come out with us after the reunion. Let's hang out." And I was thinking, this is just so so odd. This is not. What is this based on? This is really peculiar. And I can't erase my high school experiences and just you know, change who I am. I, I'm, I might be unrecognizable in some ways, but I am still that person that, yeah, you didn't give the time of day to before. And it was it just as a scientist geek, it was totally fascinating to me. You know, it was really interesting how that plays out. And people fall into those old habits of who hangs out with whom, even 10 years later. Even though my family's filled with amazing cooks, me being in the kitchen is basically a fire hazard waiting to happen, but I still want to eat healthy 
And if you want to eat healthier and feel your best, then listen up. This is hands down one of the easiest ways. I've been drinking something called cachava as my breakfast to fuel my day. It keeps me full for hours, and it takes less than a minute to make, which is pretty awesome. So what is it? It's been called the cleanest, most nutrient-dense meal imaginable, and I describe it as the best protein, vitamins, and everything you need to eat healthy all in one shake. It's loaded with over 70 superfoods and nutrients like maca root, chia seeds, sacha any, makai berry, acai, and coconut. And it actually tastes really good. The people who built this company started in the jungle on the side of a mountain during a health retreat. And their mission is to bring the world's best superfoods into a single ready-to-go meal to help busy people stay healthy on the go. And Kachava is offering 10% off for the listeners of our podcast. Just go to kachava.com slash creative. Again, that's kachava. K-A-C-H-A-V-A dot com slash creative for 10% off. Wow. So I, I have one question somewhat as a, a diver, you know, a, a diversion from this, but I moved a lot as a kid. So my sister and I had radically different upbringings because my dad was, my dad, like yourself, is a professor. So you know how that goes. Like he was basically doing postdoctoral work for almost 13 years after his PhD. So we moved, I think by the time I this was a sophomore in high school, I had been to probably 13 different schools. And to this day, like the high school I graduated from, I don't see it as my high school. In fact, I've been in touch with people from my first high school more than I ever have. Um, to me, it's just a, a blip on the radar. Like I told my parents, I'm like, the only thing that makes Riverside home to me is the fact that you guys live here. I would give two shits if you guys moved to the beach. In fact, I'd prefer <laughs> it. Um, but what, what impact does that have on popularity and, and likability? So people that move around a lot, um, you know, usually are more likely to either be accepted or neglected. And the reason why is because it's offering the same exact practice that we were talking about, kind of that opportunity to try and start over. And a lot of times when people move around a lot, they try and adopt like a little bit of a new identity or try to experiment a little bit with how they act and how they behave. And they find that it just takes very, very little change to make a dramatic difference and how it is that people interact with one another. So um, so a lot of times that will work out. Other times people end up in the neglected group if we're just talking about like ability levels here, because honestly, they're just coming and going so much that they kind of don't want to invest in the next place, uh, research would suggest. And they instead kind of figure, ah, you know, I'm going to make my two or three friends and that's it. I'm going to be gone here maybe in a couple of years anyway. So I'm really only interested in, you know, uh, some small close connections. But there has been some work on that. And I think that people that are able to be that versatile and nimble tend to do really well as adults um, be, as far as kind of working in different workplaces and whatnot, because they've had to practice those skills of reintroducing and starting reputations anew. And most of us, you know, I was in the same school forever, so I didn't, I didn't get a chance to change my reputation even if I wanted to. You know, everyone knew me since I was five. So yeah. there's just no opportunity to try a new a new yeah. Well, it's funny because I, I always say I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the way I've chosen to build my career is, is setting up a platform that essentially guarantees that I'll never stop meeting new people. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that you have self-selected into that. Yeah. So um, I really appreciated how you outlined these seven stages of status. Um, I'd love for you to go over them because it, it's funny because I see this with authors. I see it with people who go from sort of being, you know, out of the spotlight to suddenly being in the spotlight. Um, I, I got a little dose of it, you know, thanks to this Netflix documentary called Indian Matchmaking. Fortunately, I'd already had some experience with kind of being in the spotlight and I kind of was like, okay, this is temporary. Like, just get, like, don't get too caught up in it. But you go through these seven stages. Can you explain them to us and, and you know, maybe talk about how we can not fall victim to them? Yeah, in a nutshell. So we kind of, you know, when people do get a certain level of status, you know, there is something that is genuinely addictive about it. And I just mentioned that when I, I'm not using the term addictive um, as, a, as a broad expression, I literally mean that there is a part of our brains that is very sensitive to our ability to get power and dominance. And it makes sense if you think about you know, 60,000 years ago, us, like other species, literally had to be on a dominance hierarchy in order to have access to food and mating partners and whatnot. So this part of the brain is supercharged with dopamine and oxytocin receptors to make us really crave status. And it, it sits adjacent to other areas of the brain that make us outside of conscious awareness, because this is a subcortical area of the brain, so we don't think about it. But it makes us literally crave more of that feeling. 
So in fact, these regions of the brain are implicated in addiction. And we do tend to get a taste of some status. And it is perfectly normal for people to have a dramatic reaction to that and maybe even to start pursuing more and more opportunities to get more and more status. It never feels like enough in the same way that for addiction, it never feels like enough. What's really interesting that seems to happen very, very commonly with people that get high status, though, is that over time, they start to recognize that their interactions are based in large part on feeding that status. So they're having more and more interactions with people that make them feel good, but it's really based on just feeding that kind of addiction, that sense of, I want more visibility, I want more power, I want more people smiling at me and nodding and agreeing and wanting to be like me. And they start to develop a bit of mistrust of maybe these people only like me because of the reputation that I have. Maybe they only like my status rather than they like me. And in fact, I'm too concerned about showing my real self to, because it might have a status consequence. So people with high status will often say that over time, they become a little bit more and more sheltered to the point where they don't feel like the status is based on who they really are. And they feel quite lonely, that no one really knows who they really are. And if someone tries to get to know them, they might not trust that that's for genuine you know, motives. They say, well, they're just trying to get at me because I have power and status now. And ironically, these people that are really, really high in status, what they really want more than anything is they want likability. They want people to genuinely connect with them and enjoy spending time with them for who they are. So it's an ironic twist. We're all wanting status. They're wanting likability. Well, it, it's funny because I, I've seen this play out in my own life. So, you know, when this matchmaking documentary came out, I got flooded with uh, messages from random women I'd never met. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. You like me because you saw me on this thing. You don't know what I'm actually like. You're judging the entirety of who I am based on 15 minutes. And trust me, I'm probably going to disappoint you. I mean, I had a, I reached a point where I literally had to stop asking women who would go on dates with me to like I had to say, please, I really would appreciate it if you didn't read my books or listen to the podcast before I actually have gotten to know you because you're going to see me through a different lens. You're going to see me at my best when in reality, that's me for like an hour a day. Right, right, right. No, it, and and it sounds like you you relate to the idea that, yeah, there's a, there is a real you. You want to be accepted for who you really are, not the part that you're able to edit or curate or it kind of gave you the best lighting or whatever it may be, right? I mean, yeah. who doesn't want to be liked for who they really are? But that becomes hard when you have high status. Well, it's funny because I, you know, just as a final thought on this, I I remember writing about this today. Uh, you know, I remember it being in Encinitas, people are into all sorts of weird new age shit. Um, no offense to those of you in Encinitas. I was there for three years. But I, I remember I got matched on Bumble with uh, a girl in a dating app. And, uh, you know, she, I think she saw my TEDx talking. I think she was expecting the Indian Tony Robbins. And instead she gets me. And here I am, sort of this sarcastic guy who's unfiltered. And, um, you know, she channeled dead people. That was her thing. And I was like, yeah, this is never going to work. But that was just a, a perfect example to me of somebody looking at you through the lens of what they see as opposed to the reality of who you are. Absolutely. And I think, you know, people, people are attracted to status in part because they also want status. And just being adjacent to status actually affects that same part of the brain that I was talking about. Um, yeah. so even just vicariously experiencing it is enough to kind of get your own dopamine going. So there, there's a remarkable, I mean, not to be totally biologically reductionist, but there is a really, really powerful force that is making us, um, very, very socially aware and guided by our social experiences. All the more reason why, you know, we have to know what's going on and work around it or with it, uh -huh. or it's going to control us. Yeah. So when you talk about, uh, you know, a high school legacy, you say the basis for what we see, how we act and what we do all day, every day is in large part a function of our high school popularity. Those old foundational memories are referenced again and again as our brains help us get through the day. Now, you talk about two concepts, rejection, sensitivity, bias and hostile attribution bias. Can you expand on those for our listeners? And then um, you finally finish this by saying we're not doomed to be dominated by our past and we can override it. So let's talk about how to do that. But I'd like to do it in the context of rejection, sensitivity and hostile attribution bias. Yeah, sure. 
um, you know, when you're walking around the day and someone waves at you or you, um, you know, get into a, a Lyft or an Uber and talk with the driver, you would think that what's going on is that your brain is spending a lot of time processing what's happening in the here and now. And it's taking in all the stimuli right in front of you in order to, you know, respond to it and process it and know what to say back. So surprisingly, that's not all that's happening. Um, when people are put into an fMRI and uh, simulated kinds of interactions, you see that there's a lot of the um, area of the brain that taps into old, old autobiographical memories that's really playing a role too. Because what's happening is that we're holding up the present against a filter that was created by our past. So we're not actually seeing the world as it really is. We're seeing the world through our own personal lenses, our own filters in a way. And the time that this process really starts developing is when our brain starts becoming a really mature brain. So that's in adolescence. So while you're walking in the high school hallways, feeling popular or not, um, you are developing your filter. And the filters that you mentioned, there are a couple of them, um, as you say, a hostile attribution bias filter. So I should say we all have some sort of a filter, but these two are particularly common. Hostile attribution bias is when something happens that most people would not see as particularly aggressive or hostile or mean, but some people see the world through those mean colored glasses and say, whoa, that person that just bumped into me, they were trying to you know, intimidate me or they were trying to do something mean or that person who raised their hand and said something that I just said, they were trying to diminish my contribution. Um, now, obviously all these things do really happen. Sometimes people are trying to intimidate you or do say something that you just said. But the idea here is that with the bias is that it might be happening at times that the vast majority of others would see it differently. And mm -hmm. what's really interesting is that this doesn't just affect what we think, but in psychology, we have great evidence to say that if that's the way you interpret a social situation, that's going to affect what it is you're hoping to get out of that situation, what you deliberate saying back or doing back, even at a super, super rapid level and how you actually respond. And this is how we recreate our high school over and over. Because someone bumps into you, you're filtering that through the times that you were pushed up against the locker in ninth grade, and you respond as if someone was just really aggressive. Well, once that happens, they think, well, what are you getting out? What are you making such a big deal about? And then you actually end up getting rejected because you responded so dramatically, and it recreates our experience. Rejection sensitivity is um, not about kind of hostility, per se, but it's more the expectation that you'll be rejected. So you text somebody, you don't see the three little dots back right away, you know, 10 minutes pass, an hour pass, and you start thinking, they're blowing me off. Why aren't they responding to me? You reread your text, you know, why <laughs> did I say something weird? Was that, was that odd? You know, you show it to other people. What, did I say something weird there? That, that again, we all have done that once in a while, but a, a pattern of doing this over and over really reflects this rejection. You're looking at the world through this depressed filter. Yeah. Well, I, I've done, it's funny. The reason I laughed is because I, I literally have had that experience so many times, even very recently. I, you know, I was dating a girl. Things didn't work out with her. But I remember there was a day when I didn't get a text back from her, you know, regarding like coming and having dinner with us. And the whole day I obsessed about it with, with my roommate. And he said, you know, just do the opposite of what you would normally do which is, you know, freak out or try to respond to this. And at the end of the day, I got the response and I was like, okay, I'm, an, I'm out of my mind. Uh, <laughs> so how do we overwrite this? Like, how do we get, how do we let go of this insanity that it tends to just make us all crazy? Okay, so here's the deal. We, we talked about two filters. I want to make really clear that we all have one of these filters. In fact, people that were super popular all through high school, they have a filter of overestimating pop, uh, positivity and success at times when they should be maybe picking up on some cues that they've hurt some feelings or that they're headed towards a dead end. So we all have a filter. It might have served us really, really well at some point because that kid that got rejected every single day and pushed up against the lockers, it's good that he has that filter because the next time someone looks like they're about to push him, he knew to, to watch out and get out of the way. So these are adaptive most of the time. But um, the kinds that you bring up, can become maladaptive because we use them too much. So the first step is we have to figure out what's your filter? What is it for you? When you're about to go to a dinner party or you're about to go to a club or something like that, what's the first thought that you have? No one's gonna ask for my number or I'm not gonna be able to get anyone's number or I, I'm sure that everyone there is gonna be better looking than me. You know, 
what are those immediate thoughts that we have in those social situations? Um, and once we recognize that, we have to manually override it. So that means that you're going to have to figure out, how do I see past the filter? It, it could be a variety of ways. One is you could literally live stream kind of your reactions with the person you're with and say, hey, does it seem like everyone here is kind of arrogant? Say, no, actually, I don't see that at all. And be like, okay, I'm probably totally focusing on the wrong signals. you know, Or wait a minute, did, did that person seem like they were blowing me off? Because that seemed really dismissive. So sometimes we have to do that. We also have to look to try and find counter evidence. You know, one study was so fascinating. They showed the same movie to so many different people. The people who had experiences of rejection, they literally missed things in the movie that were positive. And they reported that the movie had way more negative scenes the people who had positive social experiences had just the opposite. So we really are missing things right in our environment. We have to take a moment to say, okay, wait a minute, this party feels horrible. This interaction feels bad. Let me find data, find evidence to the opposite of what I'm assuming right now. Maybe you won't, but a lot of times people do and say, wait a minute, actually, there were two people that asked for my number before or something like that. I kind of forgot about that. I accentuated the negative rather than the positive. And then we have to try new behaviors and say, okay, look, maybe I'm doing something that's eliciting that a little bit. Let me try something else. I usually stand here saying nothing. Let me go start a conversation and change my pattern. These exact things are life-changing. I mean, people literally recognize, oh my God, I've been wearing these glasses for decades. And once I started making even the most subtle adjustments, I found my niche and I'm feeling much better. But again, we never talk about those steps. So people tend to just go to every party and every relationship and they just repeat, repeat, repeat. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about uh, social media in particular. You, know, you said um, for most of us, social media is used to feel a small boost every now and then. That's not so bad if we leverage our use of social media in ways that would make us likable, at least as often as we seek recognition. But something tells me that we don't actually do it uh, as often. In fact, most of the time, people are basically putting stuff on social media to seek recognition. So it's like, oh, how many hearts did this latest picture get? How many likes did my latest status update get? Um, <clears throat> so when you guide people on how to use this stuff, because it's very prevalent in our lives. I mean, I, I think that the Cal Newport approach of zero social media, while admirable, I don't necessarily think, especially when you're you're in a pandemic, is realistic for everybody. I mean, I've tried to abide by it largely, but I still find myself on social. So um, how do we make that shift from using it to seek recognition so often? Yeah, I mean, we're playing with fire here when we're going online because, you know, those oxytocin and dopamine receptors are lighting up so much when we go on there. And, you know, this is, if you've seen The Social Dilemma, this is not an accident, right? I mean, yeah. when you log on, the first thing that you see is how many notifications and likes and you know, retweets or whatever it may be, it's right there. It's it's not hard to find. And it's done to create that addictive quality. And people are literally, especially teens today, they're physically having a hard time putting it away. So I think when we're talking about anything that's addictive, we talk about moderation. And that same thing applies here for social media. Look, if you're going to go on, you're going to play with something that you know is activating circuits that are very addictive, you got to be careful in the way that you're doing it. So People these days are talking a lot about mindful social media use. So just before you pick up that phone to look at your notifications, think, why am I going on? What is my goal right now? And develop new habits. Am I, am I feeling like I need a little bit of a burst and say, I just want to see that everyone likes my, my latest picture, my latest selfie. All right, that's fine. But then put a time limit on it and say, I got to get, I, I'm going to look. And in 30 seconds, I got to put it down. And if you're going on for other reasons, like I genuinely want to express my opinion on something or I want to connect with a friend um, or I want to get information about someone that I have a crush on, whatever it might be, then stay good, to, stay uh, faithful to that goal. And when all the alerts start popping up to make you stay on longer, resist them and recognize you're being manipulated. That's not why you went on right now. Don't go down the rabbit hole of checking and, and retweeting and posting whatever you do just to keep on getting more and more. So that mindful use is so important because we know that there are forces trying to get us to stay on as long as possible. 
So on a, on a sort of side note, has your research shown anything about dating apps? I mean, particularly because all you're doing is kind of swiping. It's, it's just another version of the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, the, the difference with dating apps, and I am not familiar with research on that, but the difference in dating apps is the entire purpose of them is ostensibly um, to try and force you into a one-on-one -on -one really a one-on-one -on -one communication. And in that way, it's it's a little bit better than social media, which is kind of trying to force you to broadcast broader and broader and broader. So in fact, it's trying to get you to force you into an in-person uh, interaction, which is great. You know, that's we, we need a lot more of that these days. Right, right. Well, let's talk um, about parenting in particular. You know, you brought up your own kids at the beginning. And one of the things you said is status seeking is only advisable if you want that child to ultimately be at greater risk for overdependency on others, risky behavior, relationship problems, and unhappiness. And what's interesting is this status seeking occurs in, in different forms. So, you know, my parents were never saying, oh, we want you to go become the star, you know, quarterback of the high school football team. But they sure as hell wanted me to have the status of having really, really good grades. Yeah, absolutely. And grades, that doesn't get you very high status among peers in high school. So that's a different kind of a different kind of status. Um, yeah. But, you know, it was amazing to me. The book came out and I was suddenly all over the country talking at schools with parents and corporations and whatnot. And some communities said, well, of course, we would never want our kids to have high status and we would never push them towards that. We're pushing them towards things like grades and responsible you know, community engagement, whatever, you know, just like you're saying. And some groups said, oh my God, you would not believe how aggressively the people in our community are trying to get their kids to become the prom queen or trying to get them to get more followers. Um, they're, they're working, you know, you think of the, the cheerleaders mom, right? Like that mm -hmm. kind of stuff going on. Um, way more than I even realized that it was happening in some parts of the country, because there are some people who have confused likability and status and think, look, I want my kid to be the most popular and we're competitive and we're at the extreme on everything else. So why wouldn't I push my kid to be the most on this variable as well? But um, yeah, just as that quote indicates, that's a horrible idea. That's pushing your kid into a risk factor. We would never hand our kids, you know, uh, the tools needed to give them a risk for cancer or for depression. But, but when we push them to have high status, or even when we subtly just reward them by saying, Oh, wow, you got a lot of invites, you know, to that party. Good for you. You got the most invites. We're subtly communicating that we value status and we're kind of pushing them to care about it more than we should. We have to be really careful. My wife does a really good job at this um, more than I do. Uh, but I um, really appreciate that almost every single day when picking up the kids or when we're sitting at the dinner table, the conversation comes around to, and my kids are young, they're eight and 10, but the conversation comes around to, you know, what did you do to help other people feel included today? What are ways that you helped other kids feel like their opinion was important? And that's fantastic. I think that's what we should be communicating. You know, you will please mom and dad or, you know, whoever your parents may be, you will please them um, by demonstrating ways in which you helped others feel connected, included and valued. Um, so we're, we're trying to directly fight against all of the forces out there that are going to be telling them that their self-worth is measured in follower counts. So, uh, you know, I've, I've asked anybody who is a psychologist or has your background, uh, you know, a, a similar question to this. But as somebody with your background, are you immune to all the bullshit that other parents have to deal with just because you have this knowledge? No, no, I think it's just the opposite. Like, I um, I think to some extent, yeah, maybe so, um, you know, can read out what's the advice that's worth listening to and not and, you know, when to get worried or not. But as a clinical child psychologist, during my years of working um, with patients so much, I've seen the, the most difficult circumstances. I've seen kids that are suffering the most. So I tend to get a little bit over-concerned whenever I see anything that looks like it might be heading my kids down the wrong path because <laughs> I think, oh my God, I know what this could lead to 20 years from now. And I imagine them, you know, in the worst of distress. And I think, I wish I didn't, I wish I had never seen that stuff because now I know what I'm scared of more. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's a blessing and a curse.
Okay, so I, I have one other question around parenting, and and this is particularly because um you know I have Indian parents, and to this day I think the the source of my the you know bane of my mother's existence is the fact that I'm still single. And, you know, my sister got married. I think that gave her some temporary relief. And the more I thought about, it, I was like, wait a minute, what does this have to do with you know our happiness? This is all about status in our community. You know, we're like, I'm an outcast in my community uh, for this very reason, and so. I wonder, you know, one, do you see this playing out in older generations where parents own status is basically something they are trying to elevate through their children? And and how do we deal with that? Because I feel like that largely is a big thing in Indian communities, because I always say it's like nobody cares about the, you know, uh, marriage. All they care about is having a wedding to go to, and then they'll find somebody else to gossip about a few weeks from now. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I think the generation, you know, the older generation now who the people who are now in the elderly group, um, I think they cared about status a little bit less than we do now, but it was still there for sure. I mean, it's funny, I um, I proposed to my wife before the Jewish High Holidays and um, no, sorry, right after the Jewish High Holidays. And uh, and when I told my mom that, you know, we had gotten engaged, she said, I if you had done it a couple of weeks earlier, she could have showed the ring to everyone at Temple during the holidays. And um, <laughs> and I thought, why does that matter? Like, what? Why are you saying that? But, you know, it, it really speaks to your point that for her, you know, yeah, it, what's important is that once you're engaged, that's a marker of status, you know, and you need to show the ring, you know, to everybody um, in your community. That was, it was just like what you're saying. And it kind of dawned on me, yeah, look, she's interested in, in status too, and getting that moment of being the center of attention and whatever. Um, yeah, it's, look, it's natural human behavior. We, I don't care, you know, there are some people who exhibit really interesting symptoms um, where they might be feeling particularly disconnected to the social world. But for the vast majority of us, we are biologically programmed and evolutionarily programmed to care what other people think of us. And we're gonna seek status every once in a while. Um, the thing that I really hope people recognize is that that can go way awry and it can go way out of check, especially today more than ever, unless we, re unless we know what's happening, unless we can take control of it. That's what I'm hoping people really get from this is that you don't have to be a status seeker and you can make another choice. Um, you can use that instinct and use it for relationships rather than trying to pump yourself up and seem better than everyone else. Wow. Wow. Um, this has been absolutely fascinating. So I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? What do I think it is that makes somebody unmistakable? I think somebody who is living life according to their own values. I think some somebody who is consistent with what they really care about and how they spend their time and their energy and their focus. I think that if we, if we don't get swept up in so many of the things that are trying to capture our attention and get us excited and get us motivated towards things we actually don't care about, but we instead wake up every day with a pretty clear goal of what's important to us, and we can look back on the end of the day and say, that's where I dedicated my energy. I think that that helps us live lives that we can be proud of, that we can feel like was worth living. I think that would make us feel unmistakable. Amazing. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your insights uh, and uh, wisdom with our listeners. Where can people find out more about you, uh, your work, the book, and everything else that you're up to? Thanks so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Uh, the book is, yeah, called Popular, and my name is Mitch Princeton, and the book's available everywhere. Um, and I have a website at mitchprinstein.com that gives more information on the book as well. And thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun. Absolutely. And for everyone listening, we will wrap the show with that. So just hang tight for a second. Let's face it. Everyone hates passwords. They need to be complex, hard to guess, and most importantly, unique. Passwords are also involved in most hacking-related data breaches because attackers know they are a reliable weakness to exploit. CyberArk Identity can help you eliminate passwords and secure access on any device at just the right time. 
don't wait until you've been breached to improve your security. Learn more about CyberArk today.